Insurance doesn't have to be a headache. Hodinkee Insurance is the fastest and easiest way to protect the watches you love. So, what are you waiting for? Sign up today. Where's the line between consistency and monotony? I think that's what we need to explore. And it's a moving line. It's a line that shifts every hour, every, every minute, every second of every day. The line between consistency and monotony is going like <laughs> Consistency, monotony, monotony, consistency, art. That's how I see it. Hey, Hodinkee, what's the best way to figure out the insurance value of a watch? Is it what I originally paid, or how much would it cost to buy it again today? The funny thing, uh, if I can put it that way, about asking me this question is that I am probably the single worst person in the company to ask about insurance. I, mean, I think everybody knows Hodinkee offers insurance. Um, it's not a part of the business that uh, I touch, and um, I don't know whether I should say this on camera, but I haven't been as good about insuring my watches as I should be. However, in preparation for this uh, trenchant question, I actually tried using the Hodinkee app to insure one of my watches, and I have to say, um, you know, like it, it took less than five minutes. Uh, and you are invited at one point to uh, say what you want the insured value of your watch to be. So you can say, I want to insure my stainless steel uh, Rolex Daytona for five dollars, if you are feeling particularly masochistic. Or you can say you want to insure it for $500,000 if you want to be completely unrealistic. I don't know, that might not be unrealistic. I, I actually don't know what the market for steel, stainless steel Daytonas is right now. What I would suggest and what the folks who actually touch uh, Hodinky Insurance and know about this stuff suggest is that uh, do not insure your watch for the retail value of the watch. Insure it for the actual market cost as closely as you can estimate it, the actual market price of the watch. Like maybe you bought a stainless steel Daytona you know, for um, under $10,000 list five years ago, six years ago, you know, whatever the price was. And, you know, the price has, you know, quintupled since then. Whatever uh, it is you want to insure the watch for, um, peg the insured value to the actual cost of the watch on the market as it, as it exists today. The current replacement value is usually more or less synonymous with the current market value. So, like, if you own a stainless steel Rolex Daytona, just hypothetically, um, the replacement value for that model is not the list price for uh, a current model Daytona. It's the, it's, it's the replacement cost for that particular model, which if it's a vintage model, may be two orders of magnitude greater than the uh, cost of just like going out and buying a stainless steel Daytona list, which you can't do anyway. Hey, Hodinky, I'm baffled by the butterfly clasp, but I imagine it's gotta be good for something. Does this bulky, cumbersome feature have a certain favored use case? I mean, you know, it's, first of all, it's funny to use the word baffled in this particular context because, you know, like typically when people say they're baffled by something, I mean, it can be something really, really big, like, you know, you're sort of baffled about your place in the universe and what it actually means to inhabit an apparently infinite and meaningless universe. And for somebody who really cares about watches, things that would not, would be inconsequential, much, much less baffling uh, to most people, can actually become kind of, kind of baffling to think about. So butterfly clasps, folding clasps. Um, I personally prefer pin buckles as a general rule just because I do find butterfly clasps and folding clasps, especially on a leather strap, they introduce uh, a, a certain amount of bulk and a, a certain amount of inflexibility, which I think is a little bit antithetical to what you want to get out of a leather strap. However, there are a couple of situations where I think it's definitely preferable. The first is if you have a heavier watch especially and you're concerned about dropping it, uh, if you unbuckle a pin buckle, which is ha I think has happened to all of us who've you know, been in involved in watches longer than five minutes. Uh, having a, a folding butterfly clasp actually ensures the watch won't fall off your wrist when you're putting it on or taking it off. Another situation where a butterfly clasp might be desirable is if you have a watch with an integrated bracelet. A butterfly clasp is invisible when you close it, and so you have an opportunity to create a really seamless visual and tactile experience with an integrated bracelet, bracelet watch. And those are two situations where I think um, the uh, butterfly clasp can really, um, can really fly. Hey Hodinky, what options would you recommend for an affordable or semi-affordable triple calendar watch? Uh, the triple calendar and the triple calendar moon phase are two really, really wonderful complications which um, it's a little bit difficult to find them at an approachable price point actually. There are fairly expensive ones, Vacheron Constantin makes one, Jeux Je Lecotre in the Master Series. If you're looking for something that's really affordable, affordable, there are some wonderful options from Longines. A lot of uh, the, the afford, quote-unquote affordable uh, triple calendar watches and triple calendar moon phase watches are actually based on the Valjoux 7750. 
So if you can live with a relative thickness of that particular movement, and with some of its other idiosyncrasies, like, uh, you know, they tend to have a very audible rotor and uh, a very palpable one, too. You can really feel it doing its thing. A Valju 7750 or Ada 7750 based uh, triple calendar moon phase is a really great affordable option. They have gotten fairly expensive, but if you're looking vintage, there are some wonderful choices. My personal favorite is the triple calendar moon phase of Valju 88 caliber. The Valju 88 caliber uh, was not made in terribly large numbers. And it's kind of collectible as a movement. Pretty much any watch that has one in it is going to be interesting as a watch and interesting to collect. And I know collectors who actually, they, they kind of concentrate on collecting triple calendar moon phase watches with a Valju 88, triple calendar moon phase chronograph movement in it. I, I should specify that. It's a complication where the charm really has to do with what you see on the dial side of the watch anyway, and not necessarily with the movement. So you're not really giving up all that much finding an affordable one. You're still going to get like, I would say 85% of the visual pleasure out of it that you would with a much, much more expensive watch. Hey Hodinki, has any manufacturer created a self-winding chronograph that also has a beautiful movement? The first thing that I would say about that is beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And there are things that are beautiful about a Valju 7750. There are things that are beautiful about a Zenith El Primero movement. You never get a chance to see one because Rolex doesn't put displaybacks on its chronographs, uh, but the movement inside a Rolex Daytona uh, has a certain kind of high precision manufactured beauty all its own. If you're looking for a movement that's beautiful in the more traditional sense, really, really high finish, lots of lovely anglage, beautifully done Geneva stripes, spotting, you know, the whole nine yards, generally speaking, you're going to be looking at pretty expensive watches. And there is a reason why a lot of people who want a beautiful chronograph tend to prefer chronographs with hand-wound movements. You don't have a rotor obstructing the view, essentially, is, uh, you know, is the deal. So the Longa Datagraph, for instance, is a classic example. Uh, any CH27-based chronographs that are finished to a high degree. Uh, there are several great examples um, of integrated uh, automatic chronograph watches that are quite beautiful. Uh, the movement in Patek Philippe's annual calendar chronograph is a very beautifully done movement. Uh, Vacheron has a beautiful movement in uh, an automatic chronograph in the Excellence Platine collection. Uh, Bulgari also makes uh, a couple of automatic chronographs uh, which have very, very uh, beautiful movements, very interesting to look at. So as a rule, um, when the, the best view that you're going to get if you want a beautiful automatic chronograph movement is going to be from something with a peripheral rotor where the oscillating mass is sitting on the outside of the main plate so it doesn't obstruct the view at all. That's kind of the best case scenario theoretically, but it shouldn't stop you from uh, admiring a um, automatic chronograph that has a full rotor that's also really beautifully finished. One of the most beautiful automatic chronograph movements is actually used by Patek Philippe in uh, the reference 5905 annual calendar flyback chronograph. That is the uh, caliber CH28520. Um, and it's a really, really gorgeously finished movement. And also uh, a historically very, one is, uh, very important one as well. Uh, Paddock was the first company to create uh, an annual calendar watch. And uh, it was an annual calendar chronograph. So it's, uh, it's aesthetically pleasing and it's also historically very valuable. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the show. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have not had a chance to check out Hodiki Insurance, um, I think it's a really interesting exercise to go through just checking it out in the app. It's uh, unbelievably fast and a really easy way to get yourself some uh, peace of mind. Do please keep the questions coming. We can't do the show without you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time.